So thank you so much for the invitation. And as Ben said, this is the second year that I'm here. And I had the honor of listening to Dr. Doty's story last year and subsequently immediately read his book on Into the Magic Shop. Have, have folks heard about the book? If you have, raise your hand. Yes. <laughs> And I have told medical students, residents, this is the, in, in medical school and residency, there's a book called The House of God that helps people prepare mentally, like what is medicine gonna be like? And I said, Dr. Doty's book is the new version of that into the magic shop. And when I read it, I was just so touched on just learning your story and, and seeing the resiliency, and I realized, wow, everything that he's described is our adverse childhood experiences. So thank you so much for making yourself vulnerable, and I know that's not easy to put down your experience and your story, but I know you have helped many people and have really opened up our eyes, my eyes in particular, to knowing it's okay, we go through these experiences, uh, but we come out on top. So thank you, Dr. Doty, and you're, as a neurosurgeon and a leader in tech and entrepreneur, it's really an inspiration. You know, your career is an inspiration for me, so. Well, Diana, that's, <laughs> that's very kind of you. I'm somewhat embarrassed because I'm a big admirer of you, and uh, especially the work you're doing in, uh, mental health because it's such a um, important area. It's an important area, not only for teens and adolescents, but it's uh, affecting all of society. And, uh, you know, maybe what we could have you do is, uh, um, it was mentioned that uh, there are all these potential initiatives in California that are going on. Maybe you could give us a little, a few of those highlights, and then uh, we can sort of talk about ACEs and, uh, how that affects so many people too. Sure, yes, so my office in particular is focusing on three areas and the, well, it, and I like to see that it all comes together. Um, the focus is on mental health, specifically transitional age youth, and Ben mentioned earlier the investments that have been made. So the Children's Youth Behavioral Health Initiative is a $4.7 billion investment that Governor, Governor Newsom um, allotted the funds so that we can reimagine what behavioral health should look like. And it is really looking to decrease stigma, open the conversations uh, for all youth, all people, zero to 25 years old, LGBTQ+, those in the rural areas, those who are oftentimes overlooked, um, African-American, Black, Hispanic, Asian, all of the populations because we know we are such a diverse state and we want to be able to provide the support wherever people are, however is most convenient to them in the language that is easiest for them to understand. And so all of those investments um, are in the process of being implemented. There is going to be an app that's supposed to be released in January uh, and that app is supposed to help with mental health resources. And um, it's, we've not seen it, but we've been told that it is like a chat bot. And that resource is going to be available for zero to 25 year olds in California. Now, it doesn't mean that we who are older can't use it. No, we can use it, right? Because um, you, you'll, it'll be open and, and accessible. But the beauty about this is that we're leading the nation in terms of how can we really develop the models. It's really a privilege to be here at Stanford. We are the, the rock bed of innovation, Silicon Valley. And there's so many of you that are entrepreneurs that have your startups. I'm always inspired by the innovation that is here in the room. So focusing on the mental health. The other is maternal mortality, California has the lowest maternal mortality in the country, but unfortunately we still have a disproportionately higher rate in the black population. And that is unacceptable. The black and the American Indian Alaska Native population here in California. And you may be thinking, well, Alaska Native, American Indian, yeah, California actually has the highest number of American Indian births in the country. And the highest number being 1,700. 
So, um, yeah, so we have an opportunity to improve those outcomes. And here being at this Mental Health Innovation Conference is so critically important because 23% of maternal deaths are due to mental health conditions, suicide, substance abuse. So this work that everyone is doing is so critically important. So thank you. Um, and so you, can, you better believe that I'm going to take back some of these ideas to our office and really expand it. And then finally, you mentioned ACEs, uh, the adverse childhood experiences, which um, Dr. Slavich spoke about earlier, is an opportunity to continue the work that is codified into statute for the position of Surgeon General. But I'm, I'm expanding it to really do the two-for-one that Dr. Slavich highlighted, which is the maternal child health. So when we address the ACEs of the moms, you have the opportunity to really improve the mom's health as well as the baby, the newborn, their whole life trajectory. So those are the, the three big areas of focus. But I know that you have, you're dabbling in, in an app, right, that is really, I think is going to be, could be transformational in terms of helping and providing mental health resources and support. Happy? Yes, uh, so I've been working on a mental health app, and many of you know there are a variety of apps that are out there. In fact, I think it's probably around 35,000. Uh, of course, only one of those are actually used at all. But uh, I've tried to look at this from a slightly different perspective because you have uh, meditation type of apps, but unfortunately these are not particularly sticky. Then the other is online therapy, which can be very beneficial. But the reality is, if all online therapy was free, there are not enough therapists to be available. But the reality is, it's actually fairly expensive. So this leaves out a huge swath of the population. Then the other uh, is chatbots, which some of you may be familiar with. But the challenge with the chatbot is you're texting into the netherworld. There's nothing there. You can't really have an emotional connection. Now, there is data, of course, that shows that it can be a benefit. But looking at this, I looked at it in a slightly different way. So what we have created is, one, an emotional assessment engine, if you will. So we look at um, facial expressions, analysis of voice, intonation, prosody, combined with converting speech to text to understand the context of a conversation. And we do this on the fly throughout the conversation. So we know what your emotional state is, whether it's getting better, whether it's getting worse. But this is connected to a conversational AI knowledge base that is populated with compassion-focused therapy and psychology. Now, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the fact that ChatGPT and some of these other LLMs, they hallucinate. And in fact, there have been instances where people have actually committed suicide uh, receiving advice from, a chat, uh, from ChatGPT or other LLMs. What we've done is, though, we have created a constrained knowledge base that sits on top of an LLM but is not part of an LLM in the sense that it will not hallucinate. You cannot troll it. You cannot go off into these uh, other areas, which oftentimes uh, some of these systems are uh, uh, happen with them. And then this, though, is connected to the most important feature, which is a human-like avatar, which you can actually talk with. Now, some of you may sit there and say, well, how is that even possible? Well, it's actually very possible. But the interesting thing is, um, <clears throat> I don't know if any of you have tried virtual reality, the goggles, and you put them on, and the frequent thing they do is put you over an abyss, and you're on a plank. And even on a cognitive level, you know you're in a room and it's safe. If they ask you to jump off the plank, almost no one will jump off the plank. And the reason is there's this incredible, powerful subconscious effect that, ha that overrides your cognitive uh, level. And so what this avatar does is it actually makes you feel like you're connecting to a human being. Now, I'm not saying this is a substitute for a human being. But if, remember, 25% of people have no one to talk to when they're suffering. Uh, if you look at adult males, 0.06% uh, uh, 
the average adult male has 0.6 friends, which may seem extraordinary. And then, <laughs> I have about 0.3, I think, sometimes. But, but uh, uh, or they should act like adults, but that's a different story. Uh, and then, though, in the, the adolescent population, it's worse because there's so much fear of judgment that they don't want to share their feelings with a person. So this allows them to interact with an avatar that is non-judgmental, that's compassionate, that is empathic. And in fact, a study that we did with half of which were adolescents, a third of which were impoverished adults, and then the remainder were cancer patients and uh, first responders. We did a study, uh, <clears throat> which is a standard psychological assessment self-report, uh, rating one as normal, five as extremely severe. Over 70% e in each category showed a two-level improvement just using the app for at least 10 minutes a day for one week, which was really quite extraordinary. And essentially 100% of people wanted to continue using the app. And this was an imperfect app. Uh, it was our MVP. But it just shows you when you can connect with something that you feel comfortable with, that doesn't judge, judge you, that accepts you, it's uh, extraordinarily powerful. And I want to emphasize, though, the goal here is not to go off into false reality. The goal here is to give you uh, a tool that helps you with your mental health, but it also gives you the confidence to go back and connect with others. Um, so we're hopeful this is going to uh, launch in January. It's called Happy, H-A-P-P-I dot A-I, uh, and you can check out the website. But hopefully this will uh, allow those uh, who are suffering to have some benefit. And uh, um, so I'm very happy that we've been able uh, to do that. And really the goal is to help so many people who are, are suffering at this point. Yeah, and, and, and I think in particular, so as an obstetrician gynecologist, you know, knowing that maternal mental health is so critically important, postpartum depression is happening in one in five women and 75% of, of postpartum moms who have mental health conditions are not getting the help that they actually need. Resources, innovative resources, um, such as your app or other apps that are out there are really critically important tools that whatever it is that we're going to need to implement. Oftentimes, uh, being a new mom is a time of isolation, and you're just there with the baby and, and taking care of the baby and forgetting about the rest of the world. So really critically important to be there for the mom and provide the support that is needed in, you know, Happy sounds like it's going to be one of those options. <laughs> well, I hope so. Uh, maybe we can talk about ACEs a little bit more in detail. What percentage of people, let's say in California, uh, are suffering from the effects of ACEs? Yeah, so the adverse childhood experiences really are fall into three buckets, which is abuse, neglect, and the other is changes in the household. Changes in the household could be something from divorce, separation, or a parent that is incarcerated. And so we know that about one in six people has experienced one adverse childhood, uh, negative adverse childhood experience. For those of you who are not familiar, because I know I was talking to some people that were not familiar about with ACEs, um, there is, it's based on, the assessment is based on a 10, uh, 10 questions. And if you have four or more questions, then that is considered to be high level. And so to have one out of 10, which is about six, uh, 60% is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a good number. 16% um, have four or more ACEs. So now we're starting to get into more, more serious um, levels of, of adverse childhood experiences. The key thing to remember about that, though, is that it unfortunately disproportionately higher negative experiences among uh, people of color, lower socioeconomic status, and this can really change the life trajectory of a person because we know that we can prevent prevent 44% of mental health conditions by addressing ACEs before um, age 18. 44%. 
um, the, the student, the undergrad student, reported her, her study and you know, went through that beautiful schematic of you know, the number of people that are trying new medications and it's not working. <coughs> Wouldn't it be great if we didn't need the medications? We just prevented the mental health conditions. So we know that it, you know, 44% um, mental health conditions can be reduced, 24% of um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, 33% decrease in smoking, 24% decrease in um, um, alcoholism. And the way that I think about it is that these negative experiences that people have, you self-medicate. You try to forget. And ways to self-medicate are <coughs> overeating, drinking, smoking, using substance, substances, and all of these can lead you to that negative lifelong trajectory. So, so critically important to realize that if we can address this, and this is something that has been, it's an investment in California for the, those who are Medi-Cal, Medicaid providers that have an NPI uh, number, that means that they can bill for Medi-Cal services, they can get reimbursed to screen for adverse childhood experiences. And they can go on the website, ACEs Aware, go through the training, and if you're a psychologist, you have an NPI number, then you can actually screen and start to help identify you know, the, the ACEs in, in a person. So it's not just children, it's more importantly, adults. Well, and this is the uh, challenge because what happens to so many children is that they carry shame with them. <clears throat> And, uh, and that shame uh, creates this uh, environment where they feel that uh, they can't accomplish anything, that uh, uh, their future is hopeless. <clears throat> and as a result, as uh, Dr. Ramos was saying, oh, thank you so much. I hope this is vodka. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want it to be anything on your brow. <laughs> Sorry, I have this uh, horrible cough. Uh, but you know, the shame that they carry, uh, really, and it's like, unfortunately, so many of us carry baggage from our childhoods. Now, it doesn't even necessarily have to be to the extent of ACEs, but this baggage that we carry so often influences every decision. It influences our partners. It influences how we interact with others. And uh, it can be very, very destructive. Uh, and as a result, so many people hide who they really are because they're ashamed about their backgrounds. And then that just fuels more of this negative self-talk, which then leads to the uh, abuse of these substances. And you know, one of the things that I learned, uh, well, there are a couple, but one is how one person can change the trajectory of an individual's life. And that's simply uh, by being present for them and listening to them, recognizing their dignity as a human being, and, uh, and actually simply caring. Uh, you know, so many of these children come from these environments of neglect and abuse, and having one, per <clears throat> one person reach out to them, be there for them, it can have a profound, profound effect. You know, for me, when I was uh, a child, when I was 12, I had this complete sense of despair and hopelessness, and that I had no future. And <clears throat> simply walking into, believe it or not, a magic shop and interacting with a woman who actually created what we call this environment of psychological safety allowed me not only to share my story, but make, uh, allowed her to offer assistance to me, which in this, which in this case was a mindfulness uh, practice. And so I was able to deal with the negative self-talk and believe of the possibility that I could change uh, my trajectory. Now, the interesting thing about that is I used to carry not only shame, but anger and hostility at the world. And what we don't appreciate is that people sense this. And what I found was when I changed how I looked at the world, the world changed how it looked at me. And as a result, it allowed me to manifest my own dreams and aspirations, which I'm very fortunate to say uh, has allowed me to be here with you today. And, and I can honestly say that I, having grown up in a single 
raised by a single mom from, from Mexico. She came from the Mexico at age 16 and would work three jobs at a time to try to help make ends meet. Grew up in South Central LA and you know had probably seven aces. So I remember 10 is the highest <laughs> growing up. Um, I, I just look back and I think, how did I get to where I am now? And, and the one person for me was my aunt who lived across the way from when I would come home from school as a latchkey kid to an empty apartment. And I knew that she was across the way sometimes. And she would say, come on over. I have something for you. And she would sit me down and just like, like you know, you're a lady. She just said, how was your day? Tell me about it. What was good? And, and it was that, that safety and it was, it was so wonderful because she would say, here, come, we're going to make some food. We're going to make some tamales today. We're going to make some enchiladas today. And so she was an amazing cook. And, and you highlighted that it's sometimes that one person. And the data shows that all that kids need are that one person to help them have a more positive life trajectory so that you can believe and you can overcome those adverse childhood experiences. You had the mindfulness um, skills that were taught by, by your friend. And for me, it wasn't, it wasn't until many years later that I, I realized, oh, I just have to breathe because I'm not breathing. I'm just like holding everything in. And, and just realizing and letting go really made a difference. And so you're right, you're, you're right, Jim, it really is what you are feeling inside and what you are thinking about is what you are releasing and the world is gonna be returning to you. And so just so fortunate to be here and to be able to be part of this audience and really the, the wonderful work that everyone is doing because we all have that one mission to address mental health, however it is from whatever angle so that we can just all be a healthier California. No, absolutely, and I, I think we mustn't forget that, you know, oftentimes when we're suffering, we don't see the reality that so many other people are suffering, and it sort of becomes a self-absorption. But what we know is, one, everyone is suffering in their own way, and just because somebody may appear affluent or uh, in a different uh, life position than you, it doesn't mean that they're not hurting and suffering. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, this idea of dealing with the baggage that each of us has, in some ways, that's liberation. But you can't be liberated until you have self-awareness and insight. And I think that's really a uh, critically important thing, as well as um, to love yourself and understand that each and every one of us is worthy. We deserve love and uh, we should have the ability to thrive as human beings. And I think this initiative that uh, Dr. Ramos is talking about uh, is the reality that Gavin Newsom and the state of California is really understanding the underlying causes of uh, so much suffering that we see. So thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe for one or two questions. So. Anyone have a burning question? Raise your hand. Okay, we got one right there. Thank you so much to both for a great uh, presentation. Um, so my question is for Dr. Doty. Uh, with the sort of the growth of AI and as you mentioned, LLMs, um, how do you envision sort of these technologies embracing our diverse sort of state and in the reality we have in California is half of the births right now are, are, are in Hispanic women. So we have a very large income and currently Spanish speaking population. So how can those technologies adapt to the linguistic needs and the cultural nuances of our rapidly diversifying uh, state and country? Thank you. Well, that's a great question. And if you're talking specifically about the project that I'm working on, um, Believe it or not, this avatar has the ability or potential uh, to speak 61 languages. And it does it seamlessly. Now, that's not how we're implementing it first, but uh, so our goal is to be able to offer different avatars because one of the aspects is you want to connect with somebody uh, who is familiar to you. 
and that can either be by sex, it can be by culture, it can be by uh, race, and it can even be by sexuality. So having different choices, having different languages, I think is critically important. And I think, uh, obviously, many of these technologies uh, appear to be for the affluent, but the reality is many of these can actually be used to help everyone. And I'm hopeful that with the work we're doing and others are doing in this space, that we're uh, going to create, if you will, a uh, compassionate and empathic AI. Now, that's not a given, uh, but I think there are enough people who are motivated to do so uh, that uh, that will be the trajectory. And even in the period of time I've been working on this for the last year, we've seen incredible advances in this space, and uh, many of them can be utilized to uh, help, if you will, a diverse population. So. Another question right here. Um, my question is for Dr. Ramos, but good to see you, Dr. Doty. Uh, the, I was fascinated with your discussion of ACEs and the work that's being done. I'm curious if, you're, if you've seen anything in the state of California uh, around um, prenatal sleep and its impact on ACEs. Uh, one of the uh, rising stars that the One Mind Foundation supported this year, Dr. Claudia Candelas at Columbia, is doing research around like the prenatal impact of, of sleep. And I'm like, wow, how far back can we go to, mm -hmm. to reduce the, the ACEs? And I'm curious if you've seen anything like that here on the West Coast. So I have not. So are you referring to the maternal or the The maternal fetal? sleep patterns while, while <laughs> yeah, the mother is expecting. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. So I can tell you, so this is as an obstetrician gynecologist and having been pregnant, that sleep is so critically important for health. And unfortunately, uh, most, I would probably say that about 90% of the pregnant patients that I cared for had a very hard time sleeping, especially towards the end of pregnancy, the third trimester. And, in, in, and when you think about it, I think that's mother nature's way of getting you ready for the sleepless nights when the baby <laughs> is born. Uh, I'm serious. But we don't, we overlook the importance of sleep and, and sometimes, we know that the impact of, of sleep, lack of sleep on health, on mental health, physical health is so critically important. And sometimes I would just tell patients, you just need to go to sleep when they were pregnant and even postpartum, have somebody watch the baby and you're gonna feel like a brand new person. But I, if you're working on really improving the sleep quality and sleep, it's so critically important. Even now, we know that there's a lot of data and studies that demonstrate you have a higher risk for obesity, higher risk for um, immune, uh, autoimmune diseases. It's, it's so critically important to, to sleep if you can and, and have, healthy sleep, not just um, REM sleep, not just to, to sleep. Yeah. Just a comment, though. I mean, you know, we talk about many of these things, but, you know, the reality is that <clears throat> so many uh, individuals have house insecurity, financial insecurity, food insecurity, and, you know, when you have all of those things on your mind all the time, this creates severe stress and anxiety, despair, hopelessness, and until we address some of these issues, at the end of the day, it's very hard to have impacts in these other areas. People don't need a minimum wage, they need a living wage. And these are critical aspects. People need access to health care, they need access to mental health. And until we as a society embrace this truth, it's going to be very, very difficult to make significant progress uh, in these other areas. Thank you so much. Um, so, big round of applause for Dr. Dodi and Dr. Lomas. I know you could ask a million more questions. Thank you so much.